thousands of years from now, when learned scholars gaze back and try to list the most important, transformative, world-changing inventions in the history of humanity, what's likely to make the cut? The electric light bulb? The steam engine? The internal combustion engine? The airplane? The automobile? And of course, sliced bread. But right up there in the pantheon, alongside all that stuff, is a more recent breakthrough, a new invention that came out of nowhere and in a few short years whipped through all our lives like a Bengali typhoon. The invention in question is, of course, the World Wide Web, an amazing and surreal universe that spawned huge fortunes, upended countless industries, and changed the way that much of the world works, plays, communicates, shops, and even falls in love. By the middle of the 1990s, Moore's Law and Metcalfe's Law were working hand in hand, fueling an upward spiral. Faster, cheaper, more powerful PCs were increasingly connected together, making the network exponentially more useful and exponentially more popular. Though the folks on Wall Street didn't have a clue about how all this technology worked, they could see that this internet thing was really taking off, turning into a bona fide mass medium, which meant that there was a killing to be made. And when ignorance meets rampant enthusiasm and unbridled greed, well, you know what that means. It means that a fantastic financial bubble is just around the corner. The cycle began in 1995, when Netscape launched its improbable and wildly successful initial public offering on the stock market. A year later came the IPOs of search engine companies such as Yahoo and Excite. And a year after that, it was time for Jeff Bezos to take the next step in pushing the web boom in the direction of bubblehood. The Amazon IPO took place in May 1997. The company was just two years old, had precious few revenues, and no profits. But Bezos was already calling Amazon Earth's biggest bookstore and hyping its potential to the sky. People were poo-pooing it as, wait a minute, it's just a bookstore, it's not profitable, it's going to run out of money and go out of business. And then you had a lot of other people saying, no, it's Dell, it's this tremendous new model and they're going to grow so quickly. And so right from the get-go, it was tremendously controversial. Bezos launched Amazon in the summer of 1995. Around the same time, down in Silicon Valley, another young guy, Pierre Omidyar, was thinking hard about the web too. Today Omidyar is a multi-billionaire, but back then he was just another idealistic software programmer, but one who had an interesting idea, the idea that would become eBay. Initially, when eBay came out, you have a lot of investment managers who would call up and they'd say, well, come on, it's just a tag sale, it's gross, and who wants to pay for these things that you can't see? We were telling the story about uh, people being basically good, people doing business with one another, and it was funny telling the story in New York City, you know, I mean, people were like, really? In the spring of 1998, Pierre and his investors realized they needed an A-list business person at the helm if they were going to get Wall Street to take eBay seriously. So we were really trying to define the company in terms of collectibles because 98% of the items on the site were in fact collectibles. eBay was scheduled to launch its public offering in September 1998, at a moment when the world economy was jittery because of that summer's Russian financial crisis. But not only did the IPO window open up for eBay, the company sailed right through it with an offering that was a success beyond anyone's expectations. eBay's stock soared that first day. By the end of it, the company was now valued at more than $2 billion. Meanwhile, Wall Street was casting its eyes back at Amazon and liking what it was seeing. Leading the charge was Henry Blodgett, who toward the end of that year declared that despite still posting huge losses, Amazon's shares would double within a year. Blodgett's prediction caused a media sensation, and that sensation sparked a buying frenzy on Wall Street. The result was that Amazon's stock price did indeed double. Not in the course of a year, however, but in the space of just a few short weeks. That was probably the start of the actual manic bubble. The fits and starts of the internet bubble were now officially over, and the era of genuine and uncontrolled madness had begun. Suddenly millions of Americans and investors around the world were stampeding to their brokers, snapping up shares in any company with a dot-com attached to its name, fueling the wildest speculative frenzy since the Dulip Mania in Amsterdam in the 17th century. Among all the forces propelling the dot-com boom, none was more profound than the democratization of the stock market. The day traders were buying stocks in the morning and selling them in the afternoon. It was 
like a national sport and an obsession in a way. And people who had never dreamed of buying stock before uh, were now just wading right into it. Tom Wolfe famously christened the 1980s the me decade. But by 1999, it was clear that the 90s had become the e-decade. Virtually every day, it seemed, at least one new e-commerce venture was brought into the world. The kids running these new companies were all fervent disciples of the get big fast creed being preached by Amazon and eBay. But when embraced by lesser minds, these theories led to an ungodly amount of sheer stupidity and to a bunch of Me Too knockoff companies with incredibly silly names. There was Pets.com, there was PetSmart, there was Petstopia, there were iPrint and iBeam, iMany, iGo, and iVillage. Then there were the E's, E-Pre's, E-Greetings, E-Merge, E-Funds, E-Loan, E-College, and of course Epiphany. There was FireDog and FirePond, Razorfish, and LoudEye. <laughs> Few of these companies had any plausible reason for existing, let alone a basic grasp of strategy or economics. 1999 was a wild year, almost impossible to fathom now. From the start of the boom in 1995, there had never been more than 30 internet companies to go public in any given year. In 1999, the total number of internet IPOs was 250. But eBay and Amazon stood head and shoulders above the rest of the dot-com crowd eBay's market value on the NASDAQ was now $21 billion, and it was even profitable. Jeff was always saying to us, actually, do not keep your eye on the stock price, which I think was very intelligent of him. You know, do your job here the best you can, do everything you can for the company. I never said to myself, gee, you know, I'm the $10 million book reviewer, because there was clearly such a disconnect between the job you were doing and the rewards you were getting that, you know, there was something, a continued, uh, you know, sort of nimbus of unreality floating around the whole thing. The epicenters of the internet bubble may have been Silicon Valley and Wall Street, but there was one central player who resided in Washington, D.C., the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, Alan Greenspan. Though Greenspan famously said that irrational exuberance was fueling the bubble, he'd done precious little during the 1990s to try and prick it. Greenspan believed that technology was creating a new economy, one where the old rules no longer applied. But after witnessing the stock market's crazy run-up in 1999, and after glimpsing signs that the overall economy was dangerously close to overheating, Greenspan decided that the time had finally come to cool things down. In February of 2000, and then again in March, the Fed raised interest rates to their highest level since 1995. Moves that signaled that Greenspan was now determined to put the bubble to an end. On April 14, 1912, the Titanic had its fateful collision with an iceberg and dropped to the bottom of the ocean. And exactly 88 years later, to the day, the internet economy met a similar fate. On what would forever after be known on Wall Street as Black Friday, the Nasdaq fell an astonishing 355 points, bringing to an awful end a week in which the index had fallen by more than 25%, the single greatest collapse in the history of the stock market. 18 months after Black Friday, September 11th happened, thus bringing to a conclusive end the long boom that had buoyed the American and indeed the world economy during the 1990s. But what about the losers, you might ask? Surely all the pain and suffering and the decimation of wealth outweighed the survival of a few perennials. At the depths of the crash, I put that question to Andy Grove, the legendary chairman of Intel. Grove is a congenital skeptic, and during the dot-com bubble, there had been no louder naysayer. But now Grove argued that the bubble had actually been a good thing. What this incredible valuation craze did, he said, was draw untold sums of billions of dollars into building out the internet infrastructure. Everything from fiber optic cable, to Amazon's customer database. And while that infrastructure would probably have been built anyway, he went on, it happened over five years instead of 15. A huge advantage to America and the world. Jobs were lost, you know, companies failed. But it's also true that out of that, many uh, new companies were created, became durable, and, and, and the economy was genuinely transformed.